everybody. Welcome to our panel, Gothic Modes in Cyber Terror. And the first uh, speaker of this panel is Laura Alvarez Trigo with her presentation title, Technology Goes Dark, Postmodern Gothic Modes in the Silence. Laura is currently a PhD candidate in American Studies at the Institute of Franklin at the Universidad de Alcalá in Madrid, Spain. She's writing a thesis on the connection between media theory and Don DeLillo. Her research interests focus on postmodernist American literature, media theory, feminism, and fan culture. So, Laura, the floor is yours. So, as Anna said, my presentation is entitled Technology Goes Dark, Postmodern Gothic Modes in the Silence. And here's a brief overview of what I'm going to speak about today. So basically what I want to do in this presentation is to present a connection that I argue is present in the silence between Don DeLillo as an author, media theory, and a characteristically postmodern nature or use of Gothic modes. So for those of you who are not familiar with him, Don DeLillo is an American author from the Bronx. He was born in 1936, and he's most often studied as a postmodern author and the key themes that the scholars have explored in relation to his works are media, terrorism, place and time, or the chronotrope, art, and structures of power. And my personal research interests center on media events, advertising, and cinema as reflected in his works. And here we have some of his most famous novels, reaching from the first one, Americana, from 1971, to his most recent one, The Silence, published just last year. So The Silence is a very short novella, just to give a little bit of context to the work that I'm going to speak about. It's just about 116 pages in my edition with a very big print, so super short. And just so you can follow a bit more easily, the summary, it's here. So the story is about a couple, Jim and Tessa, who are flying to New York and I'm going to the apartment of their friends, Max and Diane in Manhattan to watch the Super Bowl together. And the couple also have Max Martin Decker over, who is one of Diane's ex-students. As they, as they are on, on the plane, the, the main couple, they are flying on the plane, technology goes dark. So the loss of technology occurs when television, phones and computers and any other technological elements completely and suddenly stop working. So this translates most importantly into a loss of screens, with screens being very symbolic with both the postmodern and the Gothic context in this analysis. So here you have um, several covers, design covers for the novella, with the one by Seix Varal in the bottom right. Uh, this, this is a Spanish translation, and I think being, this, this is just really funny, with the broken phone tying to the stick and trying to look like an axe, which is, I feel it's very misleading because some, nothing like that, this ever happens in the novel, because the, the narrative ends practically right after technology stops working, stops working. And I think the covers help us elucidate a little bit how the theme and events of the novel have been both interpreted and marketed. So the theoretical context regarding media that I want to specifically pay attention when looking at the Lilo's work is first uses and gratifications, which focuses on categorizing the reasons why we consume media, specifically television in this study, that identifies the reasons as search for information, identification, entertainment, social interaction, and escapism. Second, the study of media effects, whether they are direct, indirect, or negotiated, that is to what extent we may or may not emulate behaviors and accept values from the media we consume. Thirdly, McLuhan's idea that the medium is the message, which is to say that every medium has a personality, its own strengths and some weaknesses that affect our response to that content. And finally, the very often related to postmodern pervasiveness of simulations as theorized by Jean Vaudrela, that refers to copies that depict things that either had no reality to begin with or that no longer have an original. So let's relate um, a bit this media theory with the social content that context, context that sparks the, its expression in fictional narratives. So we can see in the image here that I've included here is a still from Ossie and Harriet. Uh, this is just an example of an image that should feel very familiar to all of us of the American sitcom of the second half of the 20th century with the family gathering around the one TV set in their living room. In this context, on the one hand, the image of television becomes a symbol for both free time and escape, as well as for family time. On the other hand, 
the idea that television is bad for you also begins taking hold. So in, in very physical things like the radiation of television, if you watch it too much or too close, how it might damage your eyes, but also more sociological and psychological effects on the line of watching too much violent television will make you violent. And health also comes the critique to our dependency on mass media content and surveillance and how watching television affects our interpersonal relationships as it often equips us with social capital. Say for instance, you are watching the same program that your peers are watching and you can discuss it together if you know what it's about. So centering on the Lilo and the silence, we can see some of these concerns with audience behavior emerge from the beginning of the narrative. Here it's exemplified with these two quotations. In the first one, Jim and Tessa are aboard the plane and Jim watched the dangling screen and what he felt was the nudge of damn indulgence. It signals the, pressure, the pleasures of watching, but it's kind of an empty pleasure. And in the second quote, Tessa tells Jim, but you are happy about the screen. You like your screen, to which he answers, it helped me hide from the noise. Here this points more specifically to escapism, to a kind of refuge that media can offer that um, allows us to avoid confronting deeper questions about life and human relationships. And we can note um, in this distinctly for mother lack of true connection, both between them and um, with their own selves. But why connect this all to Gothic modes? And why is this important to highlight the role that Gothic modes play in the narrative? So I will focus today on two distinct aspects that are key in many Gothic narratives, or at least narratives that retort to characteristic Gothic tropes or elements. First, what is implied in the screens as metaphors of vision, as they relate to the uncanny understood as something that is kept out of sight. And we can see an expression of in mirror as a source of horror. And second, in the screens as a way to into a fractured sense of time and space or even embodying some of that lim liminal threshold leading to monstrosity or hauntings, um, as we can see in the examples here, and maybe most famously in the ring. And this horror is located in the screen first, as mentioned before through the intru intrusion of television as a central element of the home in the 60s, and as such, the way in which horror narratives, movies and TV series literally entered many households. And in this context, having the idea of television in close connection to the home brings us back to the conceptualization of the uncanny or umheimlich as I'm homely, as one interpretation of the origin of the term I suggest. And second, I often talk about the screen as a proxy for any other media technology, as it has a key role as an interface. And the Oxford Dictionary, it's worth mentioning here, I think, defines interfaces as the point where two systems, subjects, organizations, etc., meet and interact. Hence, the screen often operates as a portal to the other world, providing us with the aforementioned sense of liminality. And finally, going back to the metaphors of vision and liminal time and space, we see horror in media screens in their reflected image as a mediation, as a mulacra, that might be obscuring a hidden message or possibly obscuring us from the real world or ourselves and others through the escapist function of media consumption. Uh, finally, I uh, speak of um, Gothic postmodernity in this novel, as it clearly has elements characteristic of postmodern narrative, but it does not particularly fit into modern or premodern Gothic narrative. As Beville conceptualizes it, Gothic postmodernism is a hybrid mode that emerges from the di dialogic interaction of Gothic and postmodernist characteristics in a given text. The aspects that interact in the novel coming not only from both postmodernism and Gothic modes, but also from media theories we have seen, are the temporal distortion, the chaotic and fragmented sense of presence, present experience by the characters, and the haunted, uh, in the sense that it is reminiscent of Derrida's idea of ontology, of the presence of the haunted past, that in this case come from previous consumption of media and the nostalgia that might engulf this, and how that influences the predominant sense of fragmented self. So let's now look at some textual evidence from the novel. Although there are many passages throughout the novel that I think might be interesting to discuss here in terms of, of media theory, due to restrictions of time, I'm gonna focus only on the reactions of two characters to the beginning of the, of the technology blackout and the ending of the novel. So the first quote here follows Jim, who is with his wife in the plane, and the second Diane, who is at home with her husband and their friend. So both passages begin with almost the same sentence. The screen went blank, focusing our attention on screens. And then on, on the one hand, Jim imagines that 
quote, every passenger was looking straight ahead into the six o'clock news at home on Channel 4, waiting for word of their crashed airliner, unquote. The interesting thing to highlight here is how the natural order of things is conceptualized in Jean's mind as watching television at home, not living through a catastrophe, but actually witnessing on television as a media event, and also creating a sense of temporal distortion in his mind, especially at the time and impossible television programs that define time. On the other hand, Diane asks, quote, is this the casual embrace that marks the fall of our world civilization? She forced a brief stop of laughter and waited for someone to say something, unquote. Both the closing statement and her unanswered questions suggest a result in silence that parallels the silence of the title of the novel, but of the non-function technology as well. Also signaling a temporal distortion of the form of liminal state between the fall of civilization, as Diane puts it, and the possible futures, the unanswered doubt about what shall they do and how should they respond to this situation. So for the closing, I will just center on my character and with Max, the novel ends, and this is the last paragraph. Quote, Max is not listening. He understands nothing. He sits in front of the TV set with his hands folded behind his neck, elbows jutting. Then he stares into the blank screen, unquote. We have here again the mention of the blank screen and the silence or the character not listening, not understanding and not looking to not looking for an understanding. In this lack of catharsis, the, abs the absence of, of a return to order, we see that there is a paralysis, a lack of willingness to leave behind the constraints of media effects, as Mas continues to reproduce his learned behavior of sitting in front of his television set without expecting any deeper meaning or any answer, and how the escapist function of media helps us maintain that stasis. So the haunting of the role that television and screens by extension has in their lives operates almost as a haunting that prevents them from moving forward. The potential of the screen or the television as the source of horror is subverted as the horror begins when the screen stops working. Possibly driven by nostalgia, characters feel lost without the haunting of the screen. So what um, this, um, I think I lost my place in the, in the presentation. Sorry, I'm going to make you do some more editing. So I was, I did show you this, right? No, sorry, I wasn't lost. So uh, moving on to the conclusion. I'm so sorry, Anna. I lost my place in my word document, not the presentation. I thought I was lost in the presentation. Okay. Yeah, just do some. I'm sorry. Cutting. It's fine. I'm good. I found it. I found myself. I'm so sorry. So what I speak about when I refer to the, he, this Gothic postmodernism in the silence, on the one hand, is a sign of postmodernism. We can identify the loss of known reality, self, and well-known loss of grand narratives. The role of media in the construction of horror is most notable in the absence in realizing how both dependent and out of control we are when it comes to media. The uses and pleasures we find in our media consumption and how important they are to structure our lives. So this idea of a structure in life is especially reflected in the character's motivations. Relationships and objectives, which are all mediated through watching something on the screen for Jim and Tessa when they're on the plane, the screens on the plane, and also for all of them, the Super Bowl that they're going to watch together at Max's and Diane's. So the, the, key underlie, the key underlying implication here uh, is a concern with technology that is also a concern or a critique with technology as, um, as, economic, as the economic system that sustains it, that we can speak of as late capitalism following Frederick James's postmodernity, or maybe more appropriately in context, Mark Fisher's concept of capitalist realism. In the context of the Gothic horror, it also worth connecting to Peter Sloterdijk, who speaks of capitalism as a crystal palace build, and building on his work, Anna Carrasco Conde, in her exploration of subject and horror, aims to show how the walls of set crystal parallels are ultimately screens. And as a final conclusion, I contend that the novel exemplifies how these postmodern Gothic modes serve to express contemporary fears without catharsis or resolution. 
And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much, Laura. And I think we can just move on to our second speaker for this panel, Annie Perhentupa, uh, with her presentation that's titled Curse Tech as a Monstrous Mask, Cyber Gothic, Creepypasta, and the Threats of Technology. Annie is a PhD student at University of California, Riverside. Her research focus is on scary folklore and its monsters, both contemporary and historical, as well as in, in its remediations across media such as comics, cinema, and video games. She works primarily in English and Japanese with a name to track how monsters and spooky lore travel between these two linguistic spheres and how their interaction transforms these monsters. Ani, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, let me share my screen here. All right, you can all see it? Okay. So uh, yeah, I'm here to talk about um, creepypasta today. So thank you for having me. Um, all right. <clears throat> In the dark depths of the internet, strange things are afoot. A cursed image drives anyone who sees it mad unless they agree to share it. A long lost episode of a beloved show surfaces only to cause its viewers to commit suicide. A dead child haunts an old copy of his favorite game. These stories have no known author, no verifiable source, and yet there are pictures, timestamps, details almost too specific to be made up. Of course, it is the internet, so these kinds of stories can be trusted. They're probably not true, and yet you can never be quite sure. Uh, this intersection of horror, internet culture, and uncanny plausibility is where creepypasta lives. On a glance, these haunted tales are the same ghost stories and urban legends we've always had, this time simply experienced through the internet. However, a closer look at the genre reveals it has an uncanny focus on cursed technology and its evil potentials. Indeed, haunted game cartridges, cursed images, and the evils hidden in the dark web have become staples of creepypasta to the point where many of these have their own subgenres. This is something that cyber gothicists have theorized for years, that when examined through a gothic lens, cyberspace appears as an uncanny place, simultaneously arousing enthusiasm and fright for the potencies of technology. Through this kind of cyber gothic lens, it quickly becomes apparent that creepypasta does not simply iterate on existing ghost stories or urban legends, but vocalizes deeper anxieties concerning the potentialities of technology, its ubiquitousness in the modern world, and its frightful range of use. As a genre of the Gothic, creepypasta works to complement assumed dichotomies of technology, such as technology under control versus out of control, or even technology versus its operator. It muddles established categories and introduces deeper ambivalence into the concept of technology itself. A cyber gothic reading of creepypasta brings into focus the precariousness of technology, even when it is ostensibly under control by its operator and thus acting as an extension of them. I argue then that the popular themes in creepypasta reveal that the horror of monstrous technology is not in its rebellion over the human agent, but in its ability to work as a conduit for the human agent's own monstrosity. In order to better illustrate this argument, I will be discussing two distinct pieces of creepypasta. The Russian sleep experiment, a popular but divisive tale of a scientific experiment gone wrong, and Ben Drowned, one of the most famous and celebrated pieces of creepypasta out there. These examples show how technological anxieties that appear in creepypasta can show a surprising side to tech-based fears. That of looking into the face of the machine monster and seeing not the monstrous other, but ourselves. First, though, I'd like to go into a bit more detail about what creepypasta is and where it came from. Depending on your age and when you came to the internet, you may have run into it as those chain emails about murdered teenagers, which is how creepypasta first spread on the web. Or maybe you read the most popular creepypasta stories as they appeared in the early 2010s. Or perhaps if you're younger, you've seen it as dramatic r slash no sleep readings on YouTube. While creepypasta hit the height of its popularity back in 2014, it nevertheless continues to find new forms of consumption as the collective attention of the internet shifts from bulletin boards to Reddit, from Newgrounds to YouTube. 
In many ways, creepypasta is a modern form of horror folklore. It is authorless and sourceless and travels from reader to reader, generation to generation, finding new forms and mediums. The accessibility of both consuming and creating creepypasta, namely that anyone can do it, allows for a much wider variety of material to make it onto the community's radar. This makes it an especially apt mode of horror for examining current and emerging fears about technology. Um, all right, so the Russian sleep experiment um, is a pretty interesting example of this. Uh, there's slightly different versions of the story that circulate online, um, but the central thing is that it's supposedly from declassified military documents from World War II. So according to these uh, Soviet era declassified documents, uh, five political prisoners held by the Soviet Union in the 1940s are kept awake in a sealed chamber using an experimental stimulant gas to study effects of sleep deprivation on humans. As time passes, subjects behave in an increasingly unsettling ways. By day nine, they use their own feces and torn book pages to block all cameras and windows into the chamber, leaving the observing researchers in the dark about what is happening within. The chamber is finally unsealed on day 15, and the scientists discover one test subject dead and the other four in a horrific state of self-mutilation as they've torn off their skin, ripped flesh off their own bones, and removed many of their internal organs. The still living test subjects are removed from the chamber, but they beg to be returned into it. They fight both scientists and soldiers fiercely, proving just about impossible to sedate or quick kill. When questioned, the test subjects all indicate they have to stay awake no matter what. Indeed, falling asleep appears to kill them. The final remaining test subject begs to be placed back in the chamber. A distraught researcher demands to know what the test subject has become, since it is clear they are no longer human. The test subject, smiling, tells the researcher that they are one and the same. Sleep deprivation has merely freed what has always been lurking beneath the veneer of humanity. The researcher shoots the final test subject, and the story ends. The Russian sleep experiment first appeared on the internet in 2010 and became an instant hit, spreading across websites and inspiring both fan art and film adaptations. Yet it is also a frequent entry on worse creepypasta lists, leading to a somewhat divided legacy. Many critics of the tale locate the story's greatest weakness in the final test subject's monologue at the end. We are you. We are the madness that lurks within you all, begging to be free at every moment in your deepest animal mind. We are what you hide from in your beds every night. We are what you sedate into silence and paralysis when you go to the nocturnal haven where we cannot tread. The researcher paused, then aimed at the subject's heart and fired. The EEG flatlined as the subject weakly choked out. So nearly free. His elaborate monologue, reported word to word, undeniably hurts the very similitude of a story supposedly transcribed from military documents and introduces a certain cheesiness to the creepypasta. At the same time, it also explicitly locates the source of fear in the narrative. It was never the chamber or the stimulant gas that caused the horrifying state of the test subjects, but something within them that, has previ that had previously been restrained by sleep. The final line of the story, if quite cheesy, drives this point home. These individuals are still human. They are simply unrestrained by the conscious mind. Our inner monstrosity merely freed in its purest form. It could also be argued that a politically motivated horror is at stake. The experiment is, after all, explicitly located in Soviet Russia, and the text as subject are political prisoners. There is a sense of externalizing these technological fears away from the West, away from the US. Ultimately, however, the locus of horror in the Russian sleep experiment is not in the circumstances of the experiment itself, but in the moment where the researcher looks upon the self-mutilated test subject and in this monstrous being sees himself. Um, a much more elaborate example of this is the likewise 2010 creepypasta, Then Drowned, also sometimes known as You Shouldn't Have Done That. This story originally appeared as a series of forum posts by a user named Jed Usable as he chronicles finding and playing the secondhand copy of uh, a secondhand copy of The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. This Nintendo 64 game from 2000 is a creepy enough game on its own. In it, the player, as the perpetual hero of the series, Link, must relive the same three-day cycle over and over to prevent the moon from falling and ending the world. What is especially interesting about Ben Drown is that the readers were initially unaware that they were reading a creepypasta, as the post simply appeared on a normal bulletin board. 
The narrative begins with the narrator posting about a glitch that allows him to gain a fourth day in the game cycle, causing the game to break and killing the player character Link in new and disturbing ways. The narrator makes several more updates on his unsettling progress with the game, each of which is accompanied by a YouTube video of his playthrough, showing how the game glitches and misbehaves. The videos show in-game in text becoming garbled, Link getting transported around the in-game world at random, weird sound effects playing, and so on, proving the narrator's claims. Through playing the game, the narrator also finds out that the cartridge is haunted by a child called Ben, the previous owner of the game, who died by drowning, hence the name of the story, Ben Drowned. By itself, the story is perhaps quite trite so far. However, since each part of the story is posted as a forum post, the readers were able to interact with the narrator during the original run of the story. The readers suggest actions that influence the course of the story, one of which, playing the Elegy of Emptiness for those of you who know the game, um, leads to the climax of the narrative. The post chronicling the consequences of this action is short, describing how the narrator can't sleep or leave his room anymore because he's so haunted by the in-game events. The attached video does, however, show exactly what happened. Namely, the famous, you shouldn't have done that screen. After the screen, the game world continues to deteriorate and all text is replaced by, you shouldn't have done that. In the final entry of the story, the narrator's alleged roommate assures everyone the narrator is okay, and the rest of his story will be found in the file titled simply Truth. This document is hosted on a file sharing site and cannot be read unless the reader downloads it onto their computer. In this file, the original narrator tells about how Ben has been haunting him outside the game, censoring his previous posts and videos, and asking to be freed onto the internet through a file transfer. In a final note, the narrator begs the readers not to download any of the videos, lest Ben be released into the world. At this point, an attentive reader will realize what has happened. By downloading the final file, they have played a part in infecting the internet with Ben's corrupting presence. To drive this point home, the YouTube account hosting the gameplay videos posted a new video titled Free and changed its profile to say, Now I am everywhere, only 108 minutes after the final document became available. This narrative technique combined with the earlier interactive na nature of the story places the readers themselves in an uncomfortable role in the story. Across the narrative, the reader has gone from a passive reader to a participant to an assistant to the antagonist. In this particular creepypasta then, the amplifying effect of technology is threefold. There's the game cartridge that there's the game cartridge that allows Ben to keep existing and corrupting others after his death. The narrator's trick move of making the final installment a downloadable file, thus freeing Ben, and the reader's online participation and escalation of the narrator's breakdown and Ben's eventual freedom. At each step, technology aids the human antagonists of the story, forcing even the reader to operate the haunted technology. Through the final twist, the reader has to confront their own participation in the narrative and the realization that they are not the hero here. It is perhaps this final twist that has made Ben Drowned a lasting influence in the world of creepypasta, persisting near the top of best creepypasta lists even 10 years later. Out of the thousands of stories out there, it is the one that most tangibly forces its readers to confront their own potential for participating in technologically enabled evils, intentionally or not. In conclusion, creepypasta as a genre appears to be self-aware over where its true source of horror lies. The uses or misuses of technology in creepypasta reach for the existential anxiety of how it can be used and misused as an extension of its operator in the service of disturbing human desires. The ghost within the cartridge, its corrupted player, or the Russian sleep deprivation zombies may appear to be technological monsters on a glance, but a closer look reveals them to be fundamentally human. The technology is amplifying and enabling their monstrosity, not causing or creating it. In a world where mass media is heavily curated and often tries to distract from rather than point out what's truly at stake in society, examining freely produced material like creepypasta gives us a chance to see what the generation that grew up on the internet finds terrifying about technology. And as it turns out, it's not the AI uprising or cyber zombies, but rather the rotten people we've all run into on the internet. And the certainty that, supernatural or not, worse things are out there just waiting for you to click on the wrong link. The horror is not in the stimulant gas, 
the experiment chamber or the corrupted game cartridge. The horror is in looking into the face of this haunted technology and seeing not a monstrous other, but ourselves. Thank you. Thank you for your very interesting presentation. Uh, I think we can move on to the Q&A session if we have already uh, any question from the public or I can just break the ice, uh, just uh, wrapping up a bit uh, your presentations while our public finds their questions. I thought it was very interesting because you both were talking about, yes, existential anxieties related to technology. And I think uh, somehow the, the two presentations conversed because if on the one hand, uh, Ani was saying that um, the monster is in a way uh, the propagator, the, the person that helps uh, propagate whether consciously or not, or to some extent maliciously or not. Um, while in, in Laura's presentation, uh, screens somehow seem to help avoid facing the inner monstrosity of its user. So um, monster is somehow the human operator or the user of this technology. Can you somehow draw some connections between your presentations in that sense? Like we, in the end, which is very Gothic, we end up saying that the monster is human and the monster is inside, it's not the other. And we are othering because the monster is us. So I think um, in this sense, you can maybe say something that connects your presentation to the other. Yeah, I think that's very interesting because yes, my point was to, to see how when humans are left without these screens that help them avoid confronting their as you put it, their monstrosity in a sense, because it's, you know, exploring your own self and these things can be very complicated. And are usually, postmodernism usually deals with how we avoid these kind of things, how we are, there's no, a growth or a change in the characters such as in a traditional Ville de Roman or something like this. And I, I thought that um, in this sense, I thought that our presentations also connected a lot in terms of the, the media that I was speaking about in terms of the medium. I think this is something very interesting that Ami also addressed how the medium is the the one that allows for this type of horror to exist, but in the end, the medium and I'm gonna return to McLuhan's idea again because I, I really enjoy it. That the, he he also talks about extensions of man as media as extensions of man, man meaning human, of course. Um, so if media are extensions of human, how we use this medium, these mediums, these technological mediums, it's actually a reflection of our own monstrosity and of our own fears as Annie also was mentioning how these these stories created on the internet reflect kind of the fears of a generation that grew with the internet and this this cyber terrors and I think that's that's very that's very dependent on this idea and how we use the medium and how the medium affects how we perceive these expressions of our own fears and our responses to them. Yeah, and I also think we very tangibly tend to use screens as a kind of mask as well. This kind of like, like certain purchases are easier to make online because you don't have to like be face to face with the person. You can use kind of the screen as a medium to, to do that. And, you know, some people are really mean on the internet when they wouldn't be in, in real life because kind of using this, um, this sort of uh, mask. Yeah, I do think the McLuhan here is is quite relevant in, in the case of creepypasta as well, because the the medium is very important to the way these stories are told, I think, and the way in which they kind of evoke that sense of fear, like in the downloading the final file. If you didn't have to download it, it wouldn't work the same way for the narrative. So, yeah, it's um, really interesting that you brought that up. 
Actually, in relation to that, I'm going to jump in and answer to Annie again, um, because if we are speaking about the medium and the importance of the medium from creepypastas, and if you know me, I'm sure I've recommended this series to you before because I really like it, but um, there was this series called Channel Zero that adapted different creepypastas. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but I think it's, it's very interesting because it kind of um, the series is very good. It's uh, it's a very good horror narrative and it's very well done. It was sadly cancelled. Um, but I think it's interesting how it kind of takes away from that, you know, that medium. It returns to being kind of a normal television series where you just watch a horror narrative. It's a good one. But it's, again, it's, it's not the same at all as a creepypasta. And this also happens in podcasts, I think. I'm sure there's several podcasts I cannot think about any at the moment oh i think left and right game i think it's best so based on a kitty that creepy pasta but i'm sure there's several more that podcast that also again um completely take away from the digital all the digital meaning that this that creepy pastas have yeah i do think that that is an important like for instance the the slender man movie that came out a while ago that flopped like catastrophically like in that sense i almost feel like creepypasta is almost sort of unadaptable because then you lose like you lose a part of it it's it will reach like probably a mainstream audience that hasn't read the creepypasta but the people who have like actually experienced it sort of firsthand um might feel like something is missing from that experience because you're not like interfacing with the story in the same way so yeah kind of forced participation and multimedia nature of the narrative is, is lost. Yeah, I think um, somehow there's, there's really a, a gap between when things happen in a usual format, like a TV series or when stuff happens in the internet, there's, I think maybe a different kind of thrill to it when people are participating in this kind of chains and, and the weird stuff where you have to download, do stuff or watch videos and, you know, share it and share it again. I think there's, there's an agency really that it's lost when you're just watching a show about even the exact same narrative, but it, it's just the, the agency is totally lost, I think. Yeah, and, and like I was kind of saying in my presentation, I do think that that sort of um, agency of the like the reader um, is is an important part of the horror too. Like especially in the case of Ben Drowned, where you have to you know you have to go watch the videos, you have to download files, and and that kind of makes you it kind of implicates you. You're like a, an accomplice in in the narrative, in in a way that if you were to make a movie of it, it just wouldn't it just wouldn't be the same you wouldn't be able to kind of experience the horror of like oh no what have I done kind of feeling if, if you're just kind of receiving it passively uh I think we have a questions uh by Paul hi hi sorry I turned on my microphone hi well I've got a question for you for you both actually um to to Laura I'd like you to ask uh, answer just I haven't read The Silence, and although when you said it's only 150 odd pages, that, that appeals to me because I don't have a lot of time to read. So I'll, it's the sort of book I could read. Um, but it, the things that you were saying about the way it presents the kind of, you know, this kind of deadening effect of the screen and, and, and the way it kind of zombifies, you know, and I thought it was really interesting what you were saying about the, the, the horror is the blank screen, not the kind of screen with anything on it. I thought it was really interesting as an idea. But I just wondered if, because to me, that notion that screens kind of um, deaden and they kind of stupefy, it's quite a cliche. Don't you think it's become a kind of stereotype, really, of, of, of what happens with technology? You know? And I was just wondering if you think that DeLillo manages to avoid that kind of cliche. Do you know what I mean? If he's doing something kind of, more interesting here with that kind of concept or does it fall into a kind of much more cliched kind of technophobia i would say um i think he he's very representative because he's 
you know, I said before, he was born in 1936 and he started writing, he started publishing in 1971. So I think his, his narrative and the way he represents media and the way his characters develop through media and the way the, the cinematic influences that he has in his, in his narratives, which I think he has, they are very representative of that specific time frame, a response yeah. to media that was very characteristic of that time. So in a sense, I do think that it does um, fall into that kind of technology is scary or bad. Um, but I do think he makes some interesting explorations as well. I don't know if you're familiar with the, his previous novel, Zero K. Okay? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think, yeah, because I thought you would be interested in that one because it, it plays with cryogenics and the technology of that and the, the kind of a post-human consciousness where a woman who's cryogenized kind of speaks to the reader. And I, I think that's also very interesting. Like there's, I think there's some kind of intention there to go kind of a bit beyond what technology might what might be there but I do think he he's very critical of mass media in that traditional sense yeah. of direct effects that I was speaking about like watching violent content will make you violent kind of yeah 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 no I think as you said uh, you kind of framed it within the the kind of context of the capitalism that that technology has evolved within no and it's much more kind of I guess that he's targeting that kind of the, the, the kind of capitalist development of, of technology, you know, rather than perhaps technology per se, you know, it's kind of more uh, what's happened with technology in terms of how it's been evolved, maybe. And th that kind of links a bit to what I wanted to ask Anna, because Creepypasta, I, I don't know much about at all, but I just think it's really interesting because kind of you've got Don Didillo, who's like, you know, a really well known, famous author who's saying kind of technology oh it's a, you know it's a bit bad you know and we've got to be careful and then you've got kind of creepypasta I would imagine being written by young people do you know what I mean who have a totally different kind of concept of of what technology is to Don DeLillo you know and and to to other people you know and I was just wondering if you think that um that that kind of democratic impulse within creepypasta which is really interesting that anybody can do it F f the little that I know about creepypasta is it, there's been a kind of evolution within the within the movement, and so now kind of people are asking for recognition, you know, for their creepypasta. It's no longer just anonymous; that people are kind of putting their name onto creepypasta. And I wondered if you think that that's kind of lessened some of the impact or or some of the the, um, the integrity of the movement. Mm. Integrity. I don't know about integrity per se. Yeah, maybe that's the wrong word. <laughs> yeah, I feel like it's just kind of evolving into a into a different direction because there's still a certain like right now the kind of biggest hub of creepy pasta is there's the creepy pasta wiki that kind of hosts like the classic stories from the sort of early uh, 2010s, and then there's the subreddit r slash no sleep which is where a lot of the kind of new stories are coming out of. And I think what's really interesting about r slash no sleep is that that subreddit has an explicit rule that you're supposed to like take everything um, like as the truth. Like anything that is told to you in the stories, you're not supposed to react with like, as if it was a story, you're supposed to react as if it was a real thing. So there's this kind of like willing suspension of disbelief that is actually being enforced on kind of the most popular platform for creepypasta right now. And I do think it's kind of a different ball game in that sense, but it is still, it's still the same thing. It's kind of this like willing suspension of disbelief of like the urban legend, like, you know, it's probably not true. You know, it probably didn't happen to your friends second cousin twice removed or whatever but like a part of you just like wants to believe it so you do believe it so in that sense I feel like the integrity is still there as for the impact um I do think creepypasta has kind of lost some of the oomph over the years as kind of the attentions have shifted and the internet is becoming really less and less anonymous as we go along um, and that's kind of like hurt it a little bit, but I think these kinds of things always tend to go in, in cycles, sort of. So, you know, it's, 
it, it kind of was a thing and then it was passe and now I feel like it's on the rise again because I keep running into like Jeff the Killer which is like the worst creepy pasta and yet it was super popular back then and then everybody laughed and made fun of it for a couple of years and now it's becoming like this like this thing again like suddenly there's all this art about Jeff the Killer again and um yeah I don't know I'm really interested to see like the directions in which it develops because like if you think back to 2010 a lot of the websites that were really popular then like don't even exist anymore so in another 10 years who knows what's going to be happening like maybe we'll have a throwback to 10 years ago um in terms of how these kinds of stories are done and maybe we'll have some kind of you know dystopian hellscape where everything is tagged with your social security number and nothing is anonymous anymore <laughs> so um but i'm sure no matter what happens there will still always be um online ghost stories like this i think i think it's really interesting what you said about this this rule on on no sleep that you've got to believe it you know, because it, it kind of goes right back to the beginnings of the Gothic, you know, with the kind of Gothic counterfeit and, you know, Horace Walpole saying this is a real document that I found, you know, and it's, you know, you must believe it because it's true kind of thing. So it's kind of almost the Gothic going full circle, you know, in just in a different in a different form. But I, I'm really interested by this idea that they, they're telling you how to read things. That's really interesting. Don't you think it's like you you when you read it, you must believe it. You know what I mean? I'm, there are rules to how you read creepypasta and it's kind of like, you know, you cannot interpret it freely. You must believe it. It's, I find that really interesting as an idea. But thank you for your answer anyway. Thank you, Anna. Uh, Amaya, did you have a question? Yes. Um, actually, I am fascinated by the concept of creepypasta and you just mentioned, Annie, that these story, this is one narrative about somebody, the killer, is considered or was considered for some time as a bad, an example of bad quality creepypasta. Maybe it's a, a question, maybe it requires a very long explanation, but could you please very succinctly explain what criteria would make something, according to what criteria something would be considered as bad quality creepypasta? Yeah, that's actually a really interesting question that I've been kind of uh, meaning to get, like kind of crack into more um, in my work, because um, I think I think this is again where the kind of social contract of creepypasta, the like you should believe it comes into play because a lot of creepypasta, especially historically, um, was sort of presented as like truth. And often there's like, you know, it's formatted like an email so that it looks like truthful, as truthful as possible, or it's formatted as forum posts, even if it's not actually forum posts. And um, it's got like, there's like photos attached to it, there's videos attached to it, there's all these kind of documents that sort of prove the veracity of what is being said. Um, and I've noticed that for a lot of the sort of, you know, the, the creepy bosses that show up on the like worst creepy pasta list or the one that people are like blasting often are the ones that are like less believable or that have like less kind of supplementary material. And I think the thing with Jeff the Killer is it was just kind of this like, He's kind of a kind of a boogeyman sort of figure. He's just like this, like, oh, he's he's creepy. He's got the, you know, he's cut his mouth into a smile and he doesn't have eyelids and he whispers to you when you sleep. And um, it's like this sort of um, kind of sleepover story almost. But it doesn't come with any like receipts, you know, it doesn't have any like there are images of him. Um, but like nobody really agrees on what is the real image of him. There aren't any like, you know, there's there's no timestamps, there's no like videos or anything. So it's this like, it's really easy to disbelieve. Whereas on the other hand, you have something like Ben Drowned, where you have all these videos recreating the glitches that are supposedly happening in game. Like, I mean, obviously they're not actually happening in the game. It's like some kind of game editor that they're using or they're like hacking to make those things happen. But like, you read this person talking about how his game cartridge is, is haunted and then you have this video attached to it that shows like very 
in detail what is actually happening. It's a lot easier to believe, like it's a lot easier to kind of suspend your disbelief. Whereas then you have, you know, you have the Russian sleep experiment or you have Jeff the killer. And when you start really looking into it, it's not, it's not really that believable, especially if you first run in, ran into it as like 13 year old and then now you're 20 and you're like, man, I can't believe I was ever into this, you know, that kind of like cringe factor that goes into it. Um, but clearly there's something appealing about Jeff the Killer as well, because he keeps popping back up despite being like sort of fairly generic as kind of monsters go. Um, so yeah, my my sort of working hypothesis is that it's kind of the, the verifiability, the ability for the story to make you suspend your disbelief. That kind of is the line between good and bad creepypasta, but um, technically I don't actually know if that's true yet, and I would have to look into it a little more, but it is a really interesting question. I think Laura? Yeah, I, I wanted to follow up on that a little bit, because I know I know about Jeff the Killer, and I, I, I was thinking that there was Something that happened with Jeff the Killer that I'm sure you know it's that it sparked a lot of fan fiction. So it's the 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 response from the communities, the fan community is really interesting to me. Uh, and I wanted to ask you, and I guess this is in relation to what you were speaking about of how the medium affects because you can connect to it in the sense that you can respond, you can download things, and and I'm curious about how you think this works in relation to affect or the audience, how the audience creates effect with the, the story that they're reading or to each other and how this community develops that maybe we are doing uh, Jeff uh, the killer fan fiction not because it's good, but because it's trendy and it's something that within the community makes sense. Yeah, I think there's also an aspect of kind of um, the ability of being able to own something because like, okay, so you have um, Ben Drowned, which is like, quote unquote, a good creepypasta, but it's not something you can necessarily recreate yourself because it's so involved with like the videos and stuff like you can't necessarily very easily make your own like oh i i also ran into this haunted cartridge and here's what happened kind of thing whereas jeff the killer is is very recognizable and kind of generic enough to be inserted into almost any story so then you have a lot of people kind of talking about their own experiences with jeff the killer and that's how you kind of get this almost like um like legend cycle quote uh, or slash like fan fiction kind of thing um, where, you know, people are more ready to kind of take ownership of it because um, it's more accessible. But also what's particularly interesting about Jeff the Killer to me is that a lot of that fan fiction is romantic. It's girls writing about their romantic relationship with Jeff the Killer, which um, I don't even know how to start with that, honestly. That's... Um, I feel like that that's like a whole dissertation into itself right there. Uh, but yeah, I do think there's something to be said for like the kind of character centric creepypasta where it's like, you know, the, the um, photo negative Mickey Mouse or, or Jeff the Killer or Slender Man where you can kind of insert the character into different narratives and then everybody can kind of make their own version versus like the ones that are like, more sort of encapsulated completely into themselves like the the two creepypastas I talked about today but I think also that kind of at the same time it hurts the creepypasta because it's like everybody kind of agrees that Jeff the killer isn't real and it's hard to suspend your disbelief but at the same time you can do anything you want with him and like it's still kind of Jeff the killer so you know there's like you gotta you gotta weigh your options in, in that yeah. sense yeah, I think that's very interesting because at the same time, it gives you kind of more opportunity to interact with that, but the, it destroys kind of the way the creepypastas break the fourth wall in a sense, like it lets you in, but in a very different way, as you said. Thank you. That's very interesting. I think uh, somehow putting together again what you've been saying now in what we can call, I think, a bit of a wrap. Uh, I was thinking it it reminds me how um, 
Netflix has been doing uh, its true crime shows lately. Uh, there are often true crime um, shows that somehow have uh, a very important component on internet salutes. Uh, these communities of internet salutes that somehow uh, fucked up the investigations of something or helped the investigations or just went to a totally different way inventing, creating somehow a creepy pasta uh, studying uh, from some real investigation and then we find out that it was all false because at the end of the true crime series they tell us what actually happened and usually it's very much more boring than what the internet sleuths had created and had somehow pursued with their with their within the community and with this kind of you know internet uh, recreation reproduction and and it, it becomes every step something more complex and something that someone appropriated and invented and put its details and, and something like that. So uh, I think that's very interesting and in somehow connects to this, I guess, because I don't know if Netflix is doing this because it wants to connect a little bit to these kind of communities, to these kind of realities, because in a way it wants to warn us against <laughs> these kind of communities. So I don't know if you want just to, to share a comment in this, just to, to conclude you both. Yeah, I think that um, Netflix or the way that these, uh, let's say mass media productions work these days is that they tend to emulate something that they know it works in the internet because it feels like when you're what we I think we mentioned something like this before it feels like before the internet was more anonymous is with something more hidden in a sense but now when we are in the internet we feel like this is our little echo chamber but it's something that's very it permeates a lot of levels of society and much more that we think so I think that in this sense, it's Netflix series is kind of reproducing this, let's create some fan fiction sort of this narrative because it makes it more interesting. It's more relatable. It creates a different kind of effect, a different kind of interest and engagement from the part of the public, I think. Um, and I, I guess it's also a response to, or a reproduction of all detective narratives where the protagonist detective in some noir, from the last century, it's always this guy that's it's kind of not the good cop or an ex-cop that behaved in a kind of vigilante way. So there's I think there's that role there as well, that appealing to that kind of vigilante character that doesn't necessarily go according to the detective rules, but he's also smarter and more able to solve the crime than doing it the, you know, the the, the legal way. Yeah, I do think there's definitely um, like mainstream media in general seems to kind of um, like it feels like they often try to kind of emulate what's popular on the internet and like uh, Laura said, what's what's working on the internet, um, and they always do it like five years too late, and um, it it ends up not working out as well as they might have hoped. But I think the true crime thing, especially like. The, not just the creepypasta communities, but a lot of the internet is full of these like websites of like the weird, you know, true crime and like mysterious disappearances and, and this kind of like blending of, of legend and, and reality. And I think it really does sort of speak to the popularity of, of that kind of thinking, like all the podcasts that are out there that are like that. And I do think it's really fascinating how these kinds of things move from like kind of the fringe to the sort of mainstream spotlight on these like serial killers and stuff that have had fun clubs on the internet for years for some reason. I don't understand why people are so into serial killers, but um, that's neither here nor there. But yeah, I do think there's there's something interesting going on with um, 
with all of that. And I think my sort of other suspicion there is that the people who are making mainstream media now are the people like my age who grew up on the sort of creepypasta and, and the, the um, sort of conspiracy content and who want to, you know, see it on TV. So, so they put it on TV. Um, but there's definitely an interaction there. There's like an attempt to interface and I'm not really sure if it's successful or not, but I do think it's quite fascinating as a development. Thank you both for uh, your presentations as well as a very interesting debate, I think. So I think we can close here. If anyone in the public wants to turn on their camera just to uh, say our last thank you to our speakers. It was very interesting. So thank you again. <laughs>